Let's take a look at this preliminary NTSB report for the aircraft November 9855 Sierra, which was a PA-28-161 that crashed into a building in the Fort Pierce area in Florida. This crash was featured on Dan Grider's Probable Cause channel, where he attributed the crash to what he called a wing fail, suggesting it was something to do with the airworthiness directive that came out several years ago, where the wing was just falling off of the piper due to metal fatigue. In videos that he has since deleted, he seems to have talked to somebody fairly close to the situation who claims that the right wing just fell off during normal operations and the aircraft fell from 4,500 feet with one wing having fallen off into a shed, fatally injuring one and seriously injuring another. I can only assume that he didn't look at the actual evidence at the time uh, when he reported on this because there were several pieces of evidence that definitely challenge that narrative uh, which we're going to have a look at. So according to this NTSB report the purpose of the flight was to conduct a 14 CFR part 141 proficiency check in order for the instructor seated in the right seat to begin instructing at the flight school. The flight departed the Treasure Coast International Airport in Fort Pierce and proceeded 10 miles southwest to perform a variety of training maneuvers. The left seat instructor reported that the right seat instructor satisfactorily demonstrated maneuvers including Shandales, Lazy 8s, Slow Flight, and subsequently the right seat instructor asked him, can you show me something new? The left seat instructor responded that given he was already an instructor, there were no new maneuvers to be added. But he said, I can show you an EASA maneuver, which is the European Union Aviation Safety Agency. He described that the maneuver involved a power off aerodynamic stall and recovery without use of engine power. The left seat instructor took to the flight controls and initiated the demonstration. He pitched up and entered a full aerodynamic stall with power at idle. After the airplane stalled, he recalled pitching to the best glide speed, 73 knots in the PA-28, to recover from the stall. During the recovery with the power at idle, he stated the right wing came off and there was an abrupt banking tendency to the right. He recalled that he retracted the flaps and added rudder and aileron application, but his eyes started getting blurry and he started seeing white, and the airplane was losing altitude like crazy. He also noticed a lot of wind entering the cockpit. Subsequently, his next memory was awakening in the hospital. He did not recall observing any other components depart the airplane. Well, here's an overview of the crash site, which the NTSB laid out, and you can see that the right and left wing are fairly close together here. Here's a picture taken from the ground and you can see that the right and left wing are very close together in this field. That suggests that they both left the aircraft at approximately the same time. It also seems that the stabilator came off in two pieces and the cabin door came off in two pieces as well and that was found scattered around the area, which highly suggests that the aircraft broke up while still in the air. There was a wing metal fatigue crash from a Piper Arrow at Embry-Riddle University in Daytona on the 4th of April 2018. This led to an airworthiness directive requiring extra inspection of the wing spar on the PA-28 types. During the Arrow crash in Daytona, however, one wing remained fully attached to the aircraft all the way down to the ground, as can be seen here from the crash pictures. You can also see that the stabilator remained with the aircraft all the way to the ground. This aircraft did not break up in flight, apart from the obvious wing detachment. So the crashes already look characteristically different. Here's a picture of a PA-28 wing spar box. This is the main attachment point of the wings to the fuselage of the aircraft. Note its rectangular form. Here's a picture of the PA-28 wing spar box from the Fort Pierce crash. Note that it's kind of U-shaped and bent upwards. This is consistent with damage that you would expect from an overstressed situation where too many G's have been pulled. This is exactly what the NTSB have decided. They say preliminary examination of the wing fracture surfaces conducted by the National Transportation Safety Board Materials Laboratory found by unaided eye and by stereo microscope all fractured surfaces displayed features that were consistent with overstressed separation. There are no indications of fatigue fractures observed. So the question is, did this EASA stall cause that overstress situation? Well, I am an EASA instructor, and I have demonstrated several times a stall recovery without using power. The purpose of that is to show the student that a recovery from a stall is about reducing the angle of attack, and that powering out of a stall is not an option. 
It also demonstrates that when you use power during the recovery, you actually reduce the amount of altitude loss. So if the power is available, it is better to be used during the recovery. A stall and stall recovery are not high G maneuvers and even in the most poorly handled student recovery, I've never exceeded anything near what would cause structural damage to the aircraft. I wouldn't expect two qualified commercial pilots and flight instructors to get anywhere near that part of the flight envelope. So during this stall demonstration, what we would do is close the throttle, maintain straight and level flight, and keep raising the nose until the aircraft stalls. Once the aircraft stalls, follow the standard stall recovery without adding any power. So reduce the angle of attack by pushing the control column forward, then easing the aircraft into its best glide. If executed by a competent pilot, especially a flight instructor, this would not cause any kind of g-force that would be unmanageable for the airframe. And we can also note that the direction of the aircraft has barely changed throughout the entire demonstration. Here is the ADSB data from November 9855 Sierra and the last couple of maneuvers before the aircraft dropped out of the sky. It's this maneuver here which occurs approximately 30 seconds to a minute prior to the rapid loss of altitude that I find particularly interesting. I can't see any evidence in any of the ADSB data here that the power off stall was done. You'd see a constant straight and level altitude followed by the loss of approximately 3 to 400 feet and then a recovery and climb back to the original altitude after the power was added back in. What we can see here is what appears to be a lowered nose to gain some airspeed, followed by a rapid pitch up and a 180 degree direction reversal. And if we do the maths here, we can see the aircraft was at 5,100 feet at timestamp 160143 and 4,300 feet at timestamp 160151. That is a change of altitude of 800 feet in 8 seconds. That's approximately 100 feet per second. If we multiply that out, we're going to get 6,000 feet per minute rate of descent, followed by an abrupt level off. We then see a brief level flight segment, followed by what appears to be another pitch up with an increase of about 200 feet altitude just prior to the rapid descent. Based on the ADSB data that I can see here, it looks more consistent with an attempt at some kind of aerobatic maneuver. It certainly doesn't look like any stall practice that I've ever done. Perhaps given that everything was a bit of a blur, the instructor that survived isn't quite remembering everything that happened prior to the accident. But given that there was a fatality, I think the facts are important.